thank you for inviting me today. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we create wonder through digitization at Cleveland. So um, I, I guess that I'll just say I, I am the Chief Digital Information Officer at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And the reason my title has both in it is because um, it's really important to us that our technology department and our digital departments are all one so that we all work together so that we are building the actual physical infrastructure of the building, the um, back end design of all how all our, our data and databases work together and then creating outward experiences be it in the museum or out and beyond. So I always like to start with this slide because this has been the mission of the museum um, since 2006, um, sorry, 1916 when it um, opened. Um, and the Cleveland Museum of Art creates transformative experience through art for the benefit of all the people forever. And then we like to add bringing our mission into the digital age. And I feel very passionate about this mission and it's why I have been here since 2010. I also like to show this slide because um, it's been, I mean, I think everybody knows uh, the hardest part of doing these digital experiences is really getting support from leadership. And um, that's um, my boss, um, uh, Bill Griswold, who, um, though he doesn't come from a sort of a, a digital um, proudness, he actually got here and realized the impact it was making. And every time we've had a new idea, he has actually um, helped me get it um, uh, so that we can begin. It doesn't mean that it doesn't stop with trying to work with everybody, but he has been a big supporter. And I think that's really important for museums to be able to do anything. Um, I like to show this picture sometimes because actually when you do have a new digital project, people, somebody always brings up this slide or talks about how um, digital takes away the credibility of art and um, and it's um, and, and actually I was working in 2014 with um, Aaron Coburn on a project in um, Isabella Gardner trying to because they had um, asked us to come to bring digitization to the museum and back then we had like had three days to work with the staff and um, and we were really making some progress and on our last day the um, front page of the New York Times art section had this photo and uh, <laughs> thus we left with <laughs> with them starting over but they're doing some fun things now um, I also like to sh um, show this from um, a presentation that the form well the former former CDO Shri at the Met um, and I think it's uh, really interesting because in 1967, in the minutes of the curator meeting, it says that Ms. Irma Wilkinson has questioned the effectiveness of a computer in the catalog department. And as we all know, the Met has reconsidered that statement. So, um, uh, and I also like to bring them up because they are also someone we looked about how they did open access. So anyway, I started in the museum in 2010 and um, when I came, we were in the middle of a building project and we were in the middle of, uh, I came and heard about this lifelong learning center that we had been given a donation to use technology and um, art and uh, digital to make um, the collection more accessible, um, take away the intimidation of an art museum, um, make it really part of everybody's life. Um, and I asked, well, how are we going to support the content? And they said, oh, well, we have, we're, you know, because of this building project, we're digitizing the whole collection and we have it organized in a way that's so amazing. And I was so excited. And then I came downstairs and this is what they showed me, all these gold DVDs of the uh, collection that they were on the way to digitizing. So I realized we had a little bit more work than I thought, but I was really excited to see that digitizing the collection in a very conservative museum in 2010 was really someone had really been forward thinking and I give that um, shout out to our um, registrar's collection management team that really um, was started that. One of the processes was that since we had to take every piece of artwork off, off you that you would digitize every object as it came off you and then you would go back to 
working on all the things that have been in storage and when you um, and all the new things that went back on view, they would then photograph it now. We, they kind of stopped that for multiple reasons, but I have gotten a, especially with the open access collection, and we're in the middle of trying to be, uh, I don't know if it's the first museum, but to say that we're 100% digitized, and when I say 100%, I mean every single record. So every part, um, every component, every top of the tea kettle would have its own record and it's digitized, and we are um, hopefully, I'm, I'm saying by fall 2020, but it might be earlier. Um, it all just depends. So that's exciting. And that we also have a system in place because we are a collecting museum and we, are, we acquire objects every quarter that we will always be at 100%. That's our goal. This was the Lifelong Langer Center became Gallery One, which was the um, really intertwining of physical, digital, and um, uh, actual art and actual masterworks from our collection. Um, I like to show this original one because it was all about um, these sort of thematic groupings. Um, this is the part which we now call um, the Artlands Exhibition Area. It was a great start and it was all about using our collection and the wall right here is what um, I think became known kind of throughout the world. I've seen multiple iterations, but what was really fantastic about the wall was not the micro tiles, was not the design, all which was fabulous, not that it um, connected, well, now through Bluetooth, through your Android or your iPhone, but that you, it was live, that you can see um, objects from our collection, um, anything on view at all times. And then we have different scenes, and I'm sort of hitting myself because we do have a new scene called Open Access Objects, so that comes up also. Um, and the other thing was the app, the same thing, every object on view, when it went on, I mean, when coming to the art museum, I had no idea that artwork moves every week, 200 objects, different galleries are reinstalled. And this actually at any time, every object, every single object on view is always findable um, and then has its object page. The big part of um, that is actually really exciting to the people that come and work on my team, but was not as sexy. I think it's getting a sexiness now. What was really looking at, we had the time, had 36 different types of databases, um, and uh, this is a sort of updated version that our new director of technology has done. Um, but we really looked since 2012, how are we going to relate all our different databases, all our front ends, and all our internal systems so that we are always having one source of truth. And this is where we're currently at, and this is the talk in itself, but, um, Ethan Holda would uh, be happy to share this and talk more about it. Um, but it had to be flexible and fully integrated to do the things we wanted to do. So um, 216, we began a new iteration of Artlands Gallery. We started with Artlands Studio, which we really wanted people to create and get a relationship with our collection. Then Artlands Exhibition, we decided to remove all the touch screens and take another barrier away, put the art first, um, and that we use multiple different types of games in that area from facial recognition to um, eye tracking to um, uh, all gesture based um, ways of connecting with the art so that you understand composition, purpose, um, symbolism, and um, the emotion and gesture of an object. And then, of course, our wall has really never think it's, it's scary, but it's um, it's technically like seven and a half, actually almost eight years old because we in January of 2012, we began doing production on it and it opened the following December. And we have really done nothing to it except that it refreshes constantly every 15 minutes with new information and new data. So um, as I said, um, without constant iterative we would not be where we are. We are always look going from the front end to the back end to our software design. We are always making improvements so that we can spend the real fun and the real energy on solving the problem at hand and thinking about more ways that we can make our collection accessible to all because we truly do believe that art is a part of everyone's life and it's just about getting people to connect in to the way that they feel comfortable.
So um, this is um, in the last two years, we have a whole new middleware for all of our outward facing, including our collection online. And I bring this up because this made the technical aspects of doing open access um, really fairly easy for us. Um, I would say, you know, 80% was working with legal um, and, you know, another 15% was working with parts of the um, museum that had, you know, fears of open access. And um, I would say really 5% was the technical. And we decided if we were going to do technical, you know, we wanted our API to be um, um, easily searched. We wanted to use AI searchability. And we wanted it to be really a best practice so that other museums wouldn't have to start from scratch. They could just do what we, you know, they could see everything we did and be able to apply it to their systems. Um, the great thing, as I said, is that everything updates in every 15 minutes. So when there's a new photo, because as you know, we're in the middle of getting every object photographed. If there's a new something that goes on open access on January 1st, a whole new set of um, objects will go into the collection. But we wanted one source of truth, no matter what game you're playing, what app you're looking at, what uh, if you're looking at our collection online or if you're downloading, there is the same information. Um, I point out a couple of the other things we're doing with digital. We're using eye tracking to really get a sense of how people are looking at objects. And I know that, I, again, I'm a person that I want to make sure the technology is not a barrier and it's not interfering and it works really well. So one of the things that, um, why this is so exciting is it's really accurate. And, um, and it also only takes two seconds to calibrate your eyes. And then um, you can look at a picture for an uh, image for 15 seconds and it will show exactly where you went. Um, we also are doing things showing that you don't have to like art to have a connection. And there's this thing, you'll look at artwork, like 30 seconds, you look at different artworks and then it will give you a, a sort of, you can pick one that will give you a way to go into the gallery to um, look at it a different way. And um, we're sort of playing with different ideas there. Um, and the other thing is about really the visitors being part of this, no matter what game you're doing or what you're playing, that it shows up sort of on the, um, the intro screen that is really just letting people know what Artlands Gallery is, what's going on in there, and it's again constantly fresh with, what, with the latest people that are in there and what they're doing. And that's really important, what they're creating, because we always want to let you know it's changing and it's updating all the time. So this is something someone asked me a while, why do educators and curators need to create involving digital spaces? And, um, and I like a big part, as we already know, is to show more. In our first iteration of Gallery 1 in 2012, all our objects would rotate um, and you would be able to look at it and see more. Um, and one of the things that I should note is all the objects in that space, um, we rotate every 18 months. And the first iteration, as you can imagine, Gap, um, curators did not want to um, choose their favorite artworks to be in that space, but the director at the time said, if we're doing this, we need to have master work. The interesting thing is, objects in that space become the favorite objects of people coming to the museum, and they move back into the galleries, and now people are like finding these galleries they've never found before, because they're looking for the emerald um, Moogle pendant that was in the gallery last time and that they fell in love with in, you know, the purpose game. Um, the other thing is relating physical to digital. Merit talked about this a little bit, but it's really important. And you see an object, you'll see it projected. You then will go and play a game that talks about um, either the, the symbolism or the, you can feel, you'll make a pose and feel the stress that um, Apollo is feeling. But it then it gives you the sense that you want to go back and look at it again. And then the other thing is playing with scale. So as, as I love digital that you can make it big. You can, we have a wall, a zoom wall, which you're not showing in this space where your body can zoom into any image. Um, and that's great. But the other thing is at the end of every single game, we actually show the actual size, be it if it's a lot larger or a lot smaller, you get a context of what you're looking for in the gallery. Again, because it's important to us that um, digital brings you into the collection. And the other thing is, is the way we've done our back-end systems and what we're doing, we're able to think outside. We don't even know what the next project can be. But like this is, you know, the original label that people see 
next to art collections. And now because every single thing we do for all our interactives, it's mapped in our back end system. So the, the ability and the information we have on every object now, you know, questions like what is the new label? You know, when I've heard people talk about digital labels and a lot of times it just becomes sort of a, a, a label on an iPad, but this is a whole new way, like what is a label and what could it be with all this content and digital information we have about the object? Um, the other thing that was really fun this summer, I, I, it's like time, to, is that um, we added photogrammetry. So now, um, which is also in our online collection, um, and you can now um, investigate before you play a game, you can look at an object. This is our Wade cup, which is a really tiny cup, but it's beautiful and it has all this um, zodiacs and inscriptions on it. And you can just explore it using your hand as you see there. Um, the other thing was that we, we loved that our phone could scan throughout the museum, but we originally didn't have 3D because again, if it doesn't work really, really well, I usually take it out of the scope. We now have 3D scanning available, which is awesome. And the other thing is that you can connect your phone to any single game and it goes, um, no matter Android or, or iOS, it goes right to your photo um, area so that you don't need to be, you can take photos of yourself, but it will, you can, we again, we want to remove the barrier of you not like interacting with the game. And at the end, if you're playing something that takes a photo, it goes right to your phone. Oh, and there's the wake cup right there. Um, is that we've always from the beginning um, been collecting analytics um, for at the very beginning as you favorited something on the wall or in the app, it would show up. Um, we collected everything we share, we analyzed the best we can, but we really weren't getting good um, data. And then um, there was a talk on this last year in that um, we had a grant and our evaluation team worked with um, Rockman and they did this amazing study that really gave us some insights like never before. And one of the really, um, uh, we found out that 36% of the participants spent time in Artland's gallery who walked in the door. And that was about what we thought was right based on other types of analytics we were gathering. Um, but the other thing that was great that people self-reported that who had went into Artland's gallery, actually when they left, they reported a greater um, increase understanding and knowledge. And this was done in a way that we didn't know if people were going to Artlands or not. I mean, the study, it's on um, it's on our website. I, I recommend reading it. It's actually really interesting because it's a template for how you evaluate all digital. But we really weren't understanding where people were going, how long are they staying, where they go next. So um, we used all the data we were collecting um, from our Meraki wireless access points. And the thing that about that is, is that is a lot of big data. I mean, that is information about anyone who has a Fitbit or a phone. We don't know personally who it is, but we, we can see, um, we can track um, through, you know, sort of um, where they're going, you know, where they're spending time um, and the patterns, you know, how they came in and how they left. Uh, there were some challenges with this. There's a lot of noisy data. We had to translate devices to visitors because, you know, how, you know, someone with a Fitbit and an iPhone and an iPad, you know, that's not three people, that's one person. Um, and so we also had to look at other evaluations to build trust. Um, and so we were able to do that when we had a big Kusama exhibit because it had different patterns of people and it was able to sort of match up with what we were seeing. What we, what we did also is we brought a local data scientist, uh, who um, had graduated from Case, our university next door, and his team came in and did some really fascinating things with us to interpret the data. So first they came up with this dashboard that was showing where the amount of people were, where they were spending the most time, and we were like, this is super cool, so I brought it to the executive team, and they were like, we don't know what that means or any, it's not, you know, like they all kind of look sort of like so. So then um, I, this is like a pattern and it shows how people are moving throughout the museum and where they're going and you can look at different times of day and I showed that to them and they were like, uh, we don't, we still don't understand how to use this. Uh, we then started to make some real insights and looked and worked with the uh, data scientists and um, visitors who did not visit Artland spent 2.2 hours at an average in the museum. 
which we had already kind of known from other things, but this was good. It also built trust. And they went to a few spaces overall. We did find that visitors who visited Artland um, spent um, and were under five minutes spent about 12 minutes longer, and they did seem to visit more spaces. But the amazing thing is visitors who spent at over five minutes in Artland, um, it was, they spent between 36 minutes and an hour more at the museum. They went to more galleries, and they actually seemed to like to spend money at the cafe, which is all really interesting, and let us know that actually it was really doing what we wanted it to do, was encouraging people to get into the gallery. So this was huge to us, and it was the beginning of realizing that all this use of digital and data and the combining of physical and digital was really, you know, telling us things. And we have now the ability to ask different types of questions, like does the selection of artworks in Artland impact its gallery visits? So we're starting to look at different areas from the art of the Americas, Chinese art, contemporary, and seeing like what art people played with and then where are they going in the museum and that can that help like encourage people to go into different areas of the museum that um you know aren't is you know the favorite gallery is our um, impressionist gallery but we have one of the top asian collections in the world so maybe it can encourage people to try something new so um that's all in the middle of what we're trying to do but of course we're always continuing to iterate this all comes back to, though, um, this back end allowed us to sort of experiment with these things, to overlap these things, and the new API that allows us to implement open access. I'm going to show a quick video. With our launch of um, open access last year, it was really important that we launched with partners that could show um, what you what's possible with an open access collection. And we wanted to do it on day one so that people would immediately start using our collection. Um, and uh, it was important that it was all different levels also, that there were businesses, there was education. Um, and so, uh, the, when we launched, a month before we launched, we actually contacted people thinking, oh, there's not going to be enough time. But um, we allowed people to preview our API and preview our um, AI search. And they, so many people were so excited about it that, um, and that we were actually giving our metadata with it, which made it a really beautiful um, data set to a lot of data scientists. So, um, and I'm just showing this slide because it was so interesting to me that the people that were most worried about scholarship were the worriest, they, they worried the most that we were going to give our digital didactic over to CCO and that our provenance and um, the citations and et cetera. And all these, all these fields, if they're filled out in our database, they are available um, through CCO with every image. And the great thing about this is 
for the last eight years, I have not gotten a lot of, um, our curators have lots of exhibitions, they're always doing catalogs and research, and we weren't making a lot of movement on our database um, for our collection management system. And it is amazing because so many people are looking at our collection and asking questions. The amount of people that are adding to the data is, is, on, a, is on a daily, and it's great that we update every 15 minutes because every, there's always new data added to the collection. I use this slide um, sort of like the map, but it's, we found that it's true. Um, this is one of our famous um, this, um, stargazer, and you know museums don't have the resources, and by being part of Wikidata, it can be translated into 29 languages, and it is, and that's really exciting to us because that would not otherwise happen. Since launch, um, we in September opened a new um, search the collection. We looked at everybody's collection, so if you have a museum with a, a collection, we looked at it, and we found a lot of things that was interesting it's really hard to get to an object quickly in a museum website we found out they like to put a lot of stuff before you get there and that was one of the things we decided that we wanted to quickly get people into the collection and then we wanted a way that it was like how people are thinking about google every single field is just like you would do google and it has things that it recommends um, and we um, have, are constantly working on it, but we're very proud of our search page because, again, it's all about getting to the collection. And because of our back end, we're able to do things. This just came up this week as we have some um, visitors suggested. Um, so we're able to show, I mean, um, uh, you know, female artists, African artists, but this is like made before the, you know, artists that were made before the age of 30. Um, and different things like that. It's just actually what a visitor thinks about, we can actually help put out there for people to again get to the collection. Um, all of this is because open access, we have on every object page, you know, easy ways to contact us and we get lots of stuff every day with people giving us new information about the collection. Sometimes it's really helpful, things that people haven't noticed, it's new information, sometimes it's not so helpful, but it's like activating the collection. Thus, it's activating the people in the museum, adding to the collection on a daily basis. And um, the other big thing was, yes, we said, let's opt. not only do we never have our provenance on site online, we now are saying it's available through CCO. Um, this is big to me. It was really important that every single object page um, let you know what you could do, that you can download it. As it said in the video, we offer high-res TIFFs and we offer JPEGs and we, you know, we offer it all. Again, we don't want to consider, we want you to be able to use it for whatever way you want, but I point out this is that we're under CCO, Creative Commons Zero, um, or I always say, oh, it's Zero, <laughs> Creative Commons Zero, and it was really important that we were really clear. You can copy, modify, distribute this work even for commercial purposes. I had a fight for that little line right there, even though initially, and then when you click on it, we'll take you to the Creative Commons page. But that little line has made people feel, yes, they are transparent and they're actually using our collection again for a lot more things than they have in the past. And actually we've gotten um, from um, different publishers who said, you know, this is a great, we're gonna use this collection for the cover of the book. Two different cases. Um, I like to bring up Andres, um, who made Bot, he's Mr. Bot guy, I know you guys probably all know him, but he's done every department and our fun facts, and I have to say, I myself follow, um, and I see objects that I didn't even realize were in the collection, so it's really fun to do that. Um, uh, Case Western Reserve University has created a whole new class. It's about coding your own game, and in this class you come, and from the beginning you learn how to use tools like Illustrator and Photoshop, you learn how to code, you learn how to build a game, and they all ha have to create a game, and the rule is you must use Cleveland Museum of Arts open access in your game. And it, there's about 15 of them, and I'll put those online if people want to check them out, but super fun, and again, really great way to um, see, see how people are using the collection. Um, last year when we first opened, someone heard we were opening and they immediately got their class um, to do coding and they were in the middle of a project, an actual game class, a gaming class, and they just said you need to use the, um, the open access and this was like sort of the first iteration of they did put our collection in their game. 
Um, this was just recently, um, and it's really fun to see. This is a really one of the top favorite Cupid and Psyche images in our collection, and it was on the Dolce and Gabbana runway. And what we like to get at it again is that it doesn't matter how you're using it, who you're using it. If you're inspired by it, we're happy. Um, and then um, in Texas, they had us whole um, using uh, they liked our API, and this came from I did a talk to NASA, and they were sent, and they saw our our data set, and then they um, actually led this um, different results and really focused on um, predominant colors in our prints, and it was pretty interesting to look at that. I bring up the analytics again because we're working on dashboards. We're really trying to understand analytics for years. Everyone always talks about data, everyone talks about analytics, but we're, we're trying to say it like, how can we really show impact? How can we show that this, that open access collections does drive people to sort of understand the collection more, to come to the museum even more? Um, to There was a question on Twitter last week about, um, are people seeing more scholarship use? And so how can we really show that, I mean, we, we have anecdotal, but we want to use data. So um, uh, we, we're part of multiple repositories now, our entire collection. We update the, and it, because of the API, it updates, you know, quarterly. Um, and we just, again, looked at this in which on our website, one of the most famous, our Claude Monet, our water lilies, that's um, probably the biggest favorite painting in the collection, and it gets 200,000. Um, an image that's not so known in our collection is at 2 million. Um, the other thing that was interesting, we looked at the top 10 artworks on our collection online. Nothing in these objects was, you know, we, we know these, these are, we can, we see these all the time pretty much. Um, but then on Wikipedia, it was really interesting to see, wait, these are the top 10. And they're completely different. And it let us know our collection was being used in a whole new way that we might never have even thought about. Um, we looked at different um, between Wikimedia page views versus collection online, and decorative arts is not even gets a number on our uh, website, but in Wikimedia, it's one of the top things people look at. Same Egyptian, the difference, um, and so all of that's been super uh, exciting, and we're it's always ongoing. I never it's like I always come to the end, and the end is like we're working on lots of different ways to kind of keep understanding, keep um, creating new tool sets so that when there's a new problem or some new idea, we're able to um, sort of create, we don't have to spend a lot of time of how we're going to do it, we're able to really think about what is it. And sort of our future is like working with other museums that do open access that are tech savvy to sort of build a community to share the collections in new and unique ways. So um, thank you again for today. and. Um, and uh, oh, I always like to show our director. We did have on our open access day where we had literally a literal fanfare. Um, we then had all the different um, uh, partners that um, created things come, and there's our director uh, using a HoloLens and looking at a gallery virtually with um, that that changes every 30 seconds. So thank you again, and uh, any questions? Um, so there's uh, some questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Jane. That was really exciting. Um, can you speak to the importance of analytics and business intelligence for digital and open access? How does the evidence of impact you capture in data directly guide your customer experience approaches? We're still learning that. That's why we're, as I said, we're doing lots of things and trying to then see what we can find. But um, one thing that was interesting, as I said, we had um, Kusama exhibit here, which was um, a huge exhibit that brought people in that hadn't come to our museum before. But it was a series of seven different um, uh, different um, uh, designed booths. And um, you would have to wait online, and you would be in these 15 minute um, intervals of your ticket and so it was great because it started upstairs it went downstairs and then it was our main gallery and it continued on to our secondary gallery so we were able to sort of verify okay wow the atrium that never has people like in it in 15 minutes we, we were seeing everything that we knew was happening but the other thing that we realized by coincidence was um, and it was super, I mean, we were sold out the second we, you know, would bring tickets up every Monday and people came multiple, you know, could try to come multiple times and they could get tickets. 
They went to the, um, we think, we realized that 25% of the audience did not go to the second gallery downstairs. And it wasn't that you couldn't see it, but it, like it, we were starting to realize like, are people getting fatigue or is the, is the middle in the, is the part in the middle, does it look like they're just going to do the same thing? Um, and it gave an opportunity to say, if we made the elevator, I mean, the escalator go down the other way, would people actually go to both sides? Um, but it was, it was the beginning of showing data to other places that other than um, just the digital department on how can visitor services and exhibitions change things using the data and do some A-B testing. Great. Um, and we have another question. Are there any privacy infringement aspects associated when tracking visitors? So that's a great question. So we don't track visitors. We track devices. There is no way, and it's all encrypted. Um, there is a notification that, you know, there's Meraki endpoints that collect it. We, it, the data is so big that we actually have to kind of say like two, I think it's 2.3 um, endpoints equals a person. We can see, you know, um, we can then see like the first five places, you know, this device went and left. We can tell that if a device is in a gallery for eight hours, there's probably a guard. We can, you know, clear all that out. But there isn't any, you know, we we put legally, there's there's no infringement. We let people know we're doing it. If you have your phone in airplane mode, you know, you you can, not be tracked, but you're not individually tracked. It's um, just tracking where devices are, and they're not personalized in any way, and nor is there a way to find out, nor is the data. I mean, I guess you could, but the data is so big that is not the level. We're looking at it to understand patterns of where people are going and where they're not going so that we can make better decisions as a museum to improve the visitor experience started out as, oh, here's a way to see if people are actually going in the gallery from Art Lunch for me, because we had all these Meraki endpoints. But, um, and uh, we, we, um, and we do have a little talk on that, that, um, uh, uh, that I can also share about the privacy and all the things we, we clarify so that people understand really what's legally, you know, fine, and that people don't feel um, that, that their, their privacy is being taken away. Thank you very much. Then um, maybe I have a last question. So um, you talked about that you opened up and that you decided to go open access. Um, and how did you, this change your institution's relationship to um, those outside of the museum who are trying to reuse your data? Well, actually, it's, it's amazing because a lot of those partners you saw that said, oh, yeah, we'll try something with it because we said we'll, we'll, we'll put you as part of our launch day. And, it's a way to, to not only show off Cleveland, but show off what's going on in the rest of the world. But um, like American Greetings, for example, which that was probably, um, uh, if I didn't have a very close friend there, it was so interesting. Their lawyer kept saying, but what's the catch? Like their lawyer did not believe you could do whatever you want. Yes, you can make your own cards. So anyway, <laughs> um, but it, it was like, it took forever for them to pull because they just kept not understanding that, you know, I was like, you can put our name on the back. That'd be great, but you don't need to, you know, do what you want. So since then they have every year a, um, a, uh, they have to get all their designers like re-motivated because you know you get in a rut and they do a whole day where they just do all these different things with innovation design. They decided for their last one that they would only use the open access collection, which has brought all these people in Northeast Ohio who never who never really saw our collection. And actually I went over for the morning of that and it was amazing seeing because they have all the equipment to print this out in different levels. It was that you know, so that that's a way that they're using our collection now, like you know, and getting it out there in other ways. Um, it's also, as I said, you know, a Case Western made a whole class, um, and I saw Neil said to post the syllabus, so I will get that syllabus, and we will post that syllabus, um, which I didn't even know existed. They invited me over to do a talk at the library, and this other this professor gave his talk, and I was like, wait, can I have that? That's amazing, you know. <laughs> um, and but he does make them give credit that they have a whole credit page on their games and that that was interesting also um so it's 
it's gotten people to know, I mean, Dolce Bit Gabbana made a dress that was on, you know, Italy runway. I mean, our collection is getting out there. People are making access. And the one thing is that being in Cleveland, we are known as one of the top encyclopedic collections, but the world doesn't really know it. Scholars know it, but the world doesn't know it. And every time someone comes to our museum, they're like, wow, the question that's asked is, is that the real one? Which is, you know, ridiculous, but actually people have no idea and people are beginning to really know that this collection is, you know, worth looking at. And by giving ease, by giving tool sets that are easy to use, and by the way, anytime a developer writes something, um, we might tweak our, our API if we didn't realize or think about something that wasn't available. And we do look at, like, every time someone opens their other API, we look at what they've done and we're realizing, wow, no, you should look at ours because ours is really about getting what you need in the way you need it. And, um, and we want more people to do that so that we can figure out something that we can do all together.